Welcome to another edition of the Neurocritical Care Society podcast. Podcasting from Westchester, New York, this is your host, Fawaz Al Mufti, from the Department of Neurology and Neurosurgery at Westchester Medical Center, New York Medical College. This week, we'll be reviewing the recently published multi center retrospective study by Dr. Vincent Liu and colleagues regarding the impact of acute organ dysfunction on long term survival in sepsis. Dr. Starain Shepard will conduct the interview. Hi. I'm Storine Shepard, Assistant Professor of Neurology in the section of Neurocritical Care at Rush University Medical Center in Chicago, Illinois. My guest for today's podcast is Dr. Vincent Liu, a research scientist and critical care physician at Kaiser Permanente in Northern California. His work focuses on sepsis, acute severe illness, informatics, and healthcare delivery. He is the senior author of a paper that was recently published in June in Critical Care Medicine entitled The Impact of Acute Organ Dysfunction on Long-Term Survival in Sepsis. Dr. Liu, thank you for taking the time out from your busy schedule to discuss this paper with us. Great. Thanks for having me. So as we know, the definition of sepsis is now more than 20 years old, starting with the first definition, sepsis 1 in 1991, all the way up to the sepsis 3 definition in 2016 that eliminated the concept of severe sepsis, leaving only sepsis and septic shock. And in sepsis three, the definition of sepsis became that sepsis is a life-threatening organ dysfunction due to a dysregulated host response to infection. And thanks to improvements in the care that we as physicians provide, overall mortality in sepsis has definitely declined. Your study is very interesting in, in that it looks at types of acute organ dysfunction on mortality after surviving hospitalization with the diagnosis of sepsis. Can you tell us more about how you became interested in this specific topic? Yeah, that's a perfect introduction. I think what we've clearly seen is that a lot of the aggressive attention and focus, early coordinated care that we're providing in hospitals is reducing sepsis mortality. And that's something that we should be very you know, happy about. That's an achievement, Uh, not without kind of challenges along the way and controversy. But as you said, we've clearly seen that decrease. What we've known for a long time, particularly from work of people like Jackie Washina, is that survivors of sepsis are left with some long-term sequelae, you know, whether that's cognitive decline, functional limitations, or just increased Mm -hmm. um, mortality over time. And the question has now become, what is the impact of specific types of features of sepsis while patients are in the hospital that are associated with this deleterious uh, long-term impact? In some ways, you know, the recent large randomized trial of quantitative resuscitation or targeted uh, care, kind of a la the EGDT protocol, have shown us that just by coordinating care and getting care to patients more aggressively, we may actually, there's maybe not that much more we can do along that axis. Maybe, you know, a lot of these quality improvement campaigns have kind of given us the greatest benefit that we're going to see. Now, if we want to really make an impact, uh, we need to be focused on what's happening to patients long-term and understand whether there's interventions in the acute setting that can attenuate the long-term negative impact of sepsis. So what was the aim of this study? So what we wanted to do was look at six specific types of acute organ dysfunction, and we wanted to understand what their association was with long-term mortality. That is, among patients who survived their initial sepsis episode in the hospital, which of these six organ dysfunctions uh, you know, which are framed within the SOFA score subgroups, mm-hmm. most impacted patients in the long term. And what we wanted to do was try to get as granular as we could. We wanted to not only understand the severity of that dysfunction within, let's say, the first 48 hours, presumably when that would be related to sepsis itself, but we also wanted to control for patients who had multiple types of organ dysfunction, knowing that that's actually a very common phenomena among our patients with sepsis. And then finally, because organ dysfunction um, is 
related to pre-sepsis organ dysfunction. For example, if you have chronic kidney disease, you're probably much more likely to meet the criteria for acute kidney injury. Or if you have some kind of neurologic dysfunction at baseline, you're much more likely to have a neurologic organ dysfunction uh, when you hit the hospital. And so we wanted to do our best to try to adjust for those so that we could understand really the independent association with any organ dysfunction and long-term mortality. So this was a study of 21 hospitals within Kaiser Permanente, Northern California. So it was multi-center, but all contained within the single hospital system. Okay. And um, in sepsis in general, we use the SOFA score, which is the sepsis organ failure assessment score that we can use to determine level of organ dysfunction and it has been associated with mortality risk in ICU patients. But I see that in your paper, you used a modified SOFA score. Can you tell me more about this and how it differs from the SOFA score? Yeah, so we expanded some of the criteria for each of the SOFA components. Mm-hmm. So, and, and that was in particular in order to leverage the advantages of having data that's being collected within the electronic health record. You know, I think the SOFA, when it was originally designed, was mostly designed based on paper collection of scores. So you wanted to have kind of the most parsimonious but still important features captured. Um, Now with electronic health records, we have a very much expanded universe available to us. Now that, that brings along with it new challenges like the quality of the data. For example, uh, urine output, which might be a standard criteria for SOFA, we don't have really good confidence in the quality of that within the electronic health record. So we we eliminated that. We did include things like liver function enzymes. We included also oxygen saturation-based measures of hypoxemia instead of just PF ratios. Because as we know, arterial blood gases um, are uh, assessed in patients with a high degree of variability. And then finally, probably most important to this paper, and to your audience, is that we looked at electronic medical record-based capture for acute neurologic dysfunction, comatose, uh, agitation, free text that captured entries about patients' neurologic state. Because GCS, as we know from work uh, done by our group, work at par- as part of sepsis 3, it has shows a high missingness rate. And so depending on that alone, probably has a very good specificity, but probably a a fairly poor sensitivity for identifying patients who are actually exhibiting features of neurologic dysfunction. And you mentioned coma and agitation in neurological dysfunction. Did that also include patients who had seizures and maybe strokes also in sepsis? Yes. We were really capturing nursing documentation about kind of the mental state or the acute state of a patient. So it is true that other neurologic phenomena may be related to sepsis, may be totally unrelated to sepsis, would have influenced those Mm -hmm. neurologic dysfunction scores in the same way that they would influence what your GCS score would be. Okay. And then were you able to differentiate patients that came in with pre-existing neurological conditions that may have increased their overall mortality in the setting of sepsis? So we use a propensity-based scoring model in order to look at patients at the time they presented to sepsis, what over the past year, because in Kaiser Permanente, we have integrated healthcare, so we're able to track patients, whether they're in inpatient care or outpatient care. And what we were able to do is use over 3,000 ICD-9 diagnosis and procedure codes in order to understand what pre-existing conditions were most likely to be influential of a patient showing up with neurologic dysfunction. And, you know, some of that's in the appendix, but what it shows was that age was the most important factor, but other things were other persistent mental disorders, Alzheimer's, dementia, late effects of cerebrovascular disease, altered mental status history of fall, things like that. And, and the, they're, they're kind of not clinical terminology because I'm using categorizations from ICD-9. But you can okay. see that we were able to adjust for pre-existing uh, neurologic disease, chronic neurologic disease, 
that was likely to influence acute organ dysfunction. I guess that brings us to the results of the study. We found that about okay. two-thirds of patients had cardiac dysfunction, and the SOFA subscore for cardiac function ranges from having a low blood pressure, as measured by a MAP, all the way up to the requirement for vasopressors. So it actually spans a very wide range, and then uh, and, and mostly that was just a uh, relatively low blood pressure. But neurologic dysfunction was number two, and we found that about half of patients exhibited some neurologic dysfunction, again, based on the modifications that we had just described. That finding is pretty well aligned with prior work, suggesting that as many as half or more of patients with sepsis in a diversity of studies spanning, you know, even 20 years have some degree of neurologic dysfunction or, or acute brain dysfunction that complicates their infection. And how about the association with neurologic dysfunction and long-term mortality? Was there an association that you found there? There was an association, and that, out of all the different types of organ dysfunction, was the most robust. It was not only, by an effect estimate, the most powerful, but no matter how we did a variety of sensitivity analyses using the presence or absence of neurologic dysfunction as a binary variable, using a continuous variable, which is to say the degree of the neurologic dysfunction, using the propensity-based scoring, or just the traditional survival analysis. Any way we slice and dice the analyses, neurologic dysfunction mm -hmm. was most strongly associated both with short-term hospital mortality and then also with long-term mortality among those who survived their hospitalization. The marginal increase in the predicted probability of one-year mortality for the presence versus the absence of neurologic dysfunction, we estimated to be 6%. Okay. So I think as critical care physicians in general, not specifically in the neurocritical care world, but we often do not think of neurological dysfunction impacting mortality. After sepsis, we are more focused sometimes on, you know, increase in the liver enzymes, for example, and renal failure. Did you find this finding that neurological um, dysfunction was the most strongly associated with long-term mortality surprising? Yes and no. I think there's been a lot of work now that's built up suggesting that acute neurologic dysfunction has long-term impacts. You know, whether that's in sepsis, or in general critical illness, or even just among hospitalized patients. The whole kind of yeah. expansion of the, of the epidemiology and interventional work within delirium, I think, is a testament to people recognizing that this is a highly impactful condition, which has long-lasting consequences, even a year or more after severe illness. And, and, and we can look at work like the Brain ICU study, which proves that, you know, these patients had persistent cognitive impairment. And in some cases, you know, age didn't matter. Even if they were in their 40s to 60s, for example, they still had persistent degrees of cognitive dysfunction long after their critical illness was over. So from that standpoint, I think this is confirmatory data in a subset of sepsis patients, which really validate or kind of builds to the data which we have suggesting that acute brain dysfunction, acute neurologic dysfunction is a very, very bad prognostic sign. In terms of it being a surprise, I think really it gets to this question of, is it modifiable? If we were to, you know, is it simply a byproduct of the severity of the illness that's life-threatening, that has this dysregulated host response? Or is it something which either through antibiotic treatments or better resuscitation or even novel therapeutics or different types of adjunctive therapies like earlier mobility, changes we can make to pharmacology, is it going to be something that we can modify? Now, we tried, again, to get at that question by using these very complex propensity score models. Uh, the results did not differ that much from a traditional survival analysis. So they don't really give us strong confidence about distinguishing between a correlation versus kind of a causation. Nonetheless, I think that our data supports that if we were going to invest in something to attenuate the long-term sequelae of sepsis, targeting neurologic dysfunction 
in the acute setting of sepsis may be a very fruitful target. You know, and I certainly think that there's a lot of work going on in that space, both in sepsis and in critical illness in general. Other than neurological dysfunction, which other organ system, which was the second most likely to impact long-term mortality? Yeah, so we found that liver dysfunction was the second most impactful, although in different ways that we kind of did these sensitivity analyses, it was sometimes significant, sometimes not significant. What was interesting was that we found that actually cardiac and uh, respiratory failure seemed to almost have a protective effect or a negative association with long-term mortality among those who survived hospitalization. Now, it's hard to know how to take those results. I mean, one could say, well, maybe those patients who have that type of failure and survive, maybe they, you know, maybe there was something, they were, they were healthier at baseline. But I would say that what stands out about this study is really the focus that neurologic dysfunction kind of remained both strongly associated, but in every analysis, uh, it was robust. The other types of organ dysfunction could be that our sample size wasn't even large enough to really distinguish appropriately kind of the association there. Interesting. So what do you think are the overall limitations of your study? Well, I mean, we did do the study just in a single hospital system. And Mm -hmm. so there is you know, always the question about generalizability, but we've part you know, we participated in the steps of three definitions. We've participated in other types of multi-system evaluations and our data have always held up as being quite similar to those from other systems. We did use this modified SOFA score. So, which we thought to be more clinically relevant than just the criteria that were originally identified in SOFA, but it's important for people to understand that we weren't using just GCS because we think GCS in general incompletely captures the scope of potential neurologic dysfunction, particularly something like a delirium in which somebody is otherwise, you know, has normal motor function and is just agitated. You know, there's always the concern in these retrospective observational data about residual confounding, that is factors which were not measured in our study that are contributing to this neurologic dysfunction. We try to adjust for a patient's pre-sepsis chronic neurologic dysfunction as best we could with propensity scoring, but it's always possible that we're missing something or, or incompletely capturing that. And then ultimately, it's really, I think, a question for all of us as researchers and practitioners, is acute neurologic dysfunction modifiable or not? And if we're able to attenuate it within the acute setting, is that going to actually produce better outcomes in the long-term setting? So finally, for the listener and for us as clinicians, what should we take home from your study? I think our study confirmed existing data that up to half of patients with sepsis have acute neurologic dysfunction. It's highly prevalent. And in our data, it was strongly associated with short-term mortality. So from that standpoint, it is a powerful prognostic piece of information for us to to think about our patients and even to share with patients or their families to educate them about, you know, the likelihood of adverse outcomes, even in the short term. What our data show are that they're also the single most powerful type of acute organ dysfunction that are associated with long-term mortality. And thus, it behooves us to keep up to date, contribute to research, and do our best to identify ways to ameliorate acute brain dysfunction within sepsis. I'm not sure that today we have the exact answer for how to do that, but there's a lot of work, some of which is pharmacologic, some of which is adjunctive therapies, some of which may be earlier and better treatment of sepsis itself, which are likely to be kind of a multi-component intervention that will allow us to attenuate these long-term impacts. All right. Thank you very much, um, Dr. Liu, for taking the time out to discuss this paper with us. Great. Really appreciate it. Thank you. So that was Vincent Liu, a research scientist and critical care physician at Kaiser Permanente in Northern California, discussing his paper, The Impact of Acute Organ Dysfunction on Long-Term Survival in Sepsis, that was recently published in Critical Care Medicine.
I am Storane Shepherd. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening to the NCS podcast series, which is produced by the Neurocritical Care Society, whose mission is to promote quality patient care, professional collaboration, research, training, education, and advocacy in neurocritical care. Our production staff includes Josh Levine, Mike Brogan, Romani Ballou, Storane Shepherd, and Benjamin Miller. Our senior producer is Jim Siegler. Our administrative staff includes Sarah Mimmon and Becca Stickney. Music by Lee Rosevere under a Creative Commons license. If you like our show or want to know more, check us out on Twitter at Neurocritical, Facebook, or LinkedIn. The NCS podcast is available on NCS On Demand, iTunes, and wherever you may listen to your podcast. I'm Fawaz Al-Mufti, and thanks again for listening.